It's good to be in the Lord's house today. I'm thankful for the song. Second Kings chapter 6 is what I'm thinking about this morning. And, uh, <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 6 and verse 14. And there sent he hit thither horses and chariots, and a great host, and came by night, and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Uh, as I thought about this and looked at this, <clears throat> it's amazing what the Lord can do and will do for us in our Christian walk. And some things I thought about here is uh, uh, one thing this uh, servant here had going for him. He saw the scary part. He was able to see the enemy. He was able to see uh, what was facing them as he got up and went out that morning. I dare say that there's many of us, and sometimes I even, I don't see the problem. I don't see the, the enemy encroaching. I don't see the, the trouble. You know, <clears throat> the devil will tell you all day long that, you know, it's just a little bit of sin or it's just a little bit of problem and there's not really anything going on or there, nothing that you can't handle. You ever been told that? Nothing that you can't handle, nothing that you can't take care of. or You know, this is just a little thing. And if it's not hurting nobody else, why, why are you worried about it? But this servant saw the, the horses and the men, the chariots, and he was alarmed. Elisha didn't have to pray for his eyes to be open to see the, the problem. I believe we need to pray for America and even for our own community and for our own selves, that we could have our eyes open to the problem. We could have our eyes open and see the, the very things that are besetting us and the very things that are creeping in and, and taking hold and tearing down our nation and tearing down our, our country and tearing down our communities. <clears throat> so in verse 15 it says, And when the servant of the Lord, or the man of God, was risen early and, and came forth, behold, he was able to see. A host compassed the city both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, Master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? So many times, then when we see the problem, this is where we go to. This is our go to saying, What in the world are we going to do? Or, in my case, many times, there's nothing I can do. I'm just one person. I, I don't have that great an influence. I don't have that great. Nobody's going to listen to me, you or me. Nobody's going to hear what you've got to say. So why should he even bother? Matter of fact, the devil will tell you today, there ain't no reason to even go out there to that little old church. Nobody hardly ever comes, and, and you're just repeating the same thing every Sunday. Why would you want to do that? He'll even tell you it's boring. He'll even tell you that you're wasting your time. But the servant got it right. He went to the master. He went to the one in charge, and he said, What shall we do? How shall we do? And he answered, as many times in the Bible the master does, Fear not. Fear not. This morning as we look out, and we already talked about Israel, We've, we're thinking about things going on in our, even here in America that's never went on before. Things that are being winked at or things that are being passed over that should not be. And it's scary. And the enemy has a great hold, it seems like. And the enemy is showing large even in the front door as it was here. But I want to tell you, fear not. 
this morning. Fear not, for they that be with us, right here, the Lord, the great trinity of God, are more than they that be with them. The devil thinks he's got it figured out. He thinks he's got a great control on this nation, but God still has that power. And he's not overwhelmed. He's not surprised. He knows what's going on. He knows what's going on in Israel. All of the countries round about, he's still in control. And then he went a step further, and he prayed. And Elisha prayed, verse 17, and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. What would we see this morning if the Lord opened our spiritual eyes? What would we see this morning if he gave us that grace? I believe we'd see a great army ready to step in if, if the Lord so spoke. I believe we'd see more help than we realize we've got. I believe we'd see more grace on the way. I believe we'd see hope. I believe we'd see... Uh, power and strength in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so when we get down and we get fearful and we get uh, upset and we get to where we're seeing what the enemy's doing but we don't have any idea what we're going to do go to the master he'll open your eyes question I had and what I wondered about it was Elisha able to see those things already was he prayed up enough and, and uh, in the Lord's company enough and, and close enough to the Lord and studying his word and praying that he was able to see those things already? Did he see the chariots of fire round about on the whole mountain? I don't know that. But I do know who he went to. He went to the Lord. He prayed to the Lord for guidance. He prayed to the Lord for his eyes to be open, and I believe that's our prayer this morning, that our eyes be open. We might see what the Lord's able to do and what he will do and what he's willing to do and how he's just waiting with open arms, waiting. So many times I come to him with that big mess that I've got, that, that <clears throat> big ball of yarn that's just all messed up, and, and I've made a terrible mess and don't know what to do and I say Lord and it's easy for him he just straights it right out fear not and his power is great and his his grace and his mercy is mighty and he he takes care of us he's going to take care of us this morning and I, it's my prayer that he'll take care of the, the Smithy family and he'll be with him this morning and all those that are grieving all those that are facing something hard this morning. He knows exactly what we need. I'm Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, just for blessing us with so much. Thank you for loving us, and thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace, Lord. Just thank you, Lord, for uh, looking after us, and Lord, we come with you with a heavy heart with, uh, with the Smithy family, Lord. Just pray that you just comfort them and uh, and just let them know, Lord, that you're there with them. Lord, do pray for our country and the, our leaders. Pray for Israel, Lord, as they be in attack. Lord, just pray that you just protect them. Lord, I pray for our service today. Be with each teacher. Be with the Jeff as he comes before us today and, and preaches, Lord. Just pray that you just give him the words that we need to hear, and Lord, that we can apply to our lives and that we can just walk a little bit closer with you. Pray that all things that we do today, Lord, be for your honor and your glory. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, our lesson, is, the title is Built on Christ. And, uh, you know, any church that's not built on Christ, then they really don't have a church. You know, the bad thing today is that more and more churches are not built on Christ. They're built by man. You know, they try to do things that, that pleases man instead of God. You know, churches 
across our country are becoming so social clubs and don't even know what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. Now, I was reading here in my book, and it says that when Russia invaded Ukraine, one of the first things they did, wasn't the first, but one of the first things they did is they came in and they destroyed 494 Christian churches. But something the Russian government don't realize, the buildings they destroyed is not the church. The church members are the church because we are the body of Christ. All of us that follow Jesus, we're living in a growing body of Christ. Now we have, we have a nice building here that we call the church. But this building is not the church. We are. We're the church. You know, God places us in churches to serve, take care of each other, pray for each other. We learn more about Jesus. We teach others about Jesus. And we also give, just to name a, a few things. The church grows our relationship with Jesus. If Jesus is not the foundation of the church, then it's not a church. This is where churches are today are missing out. They're replacing Jesus with other things that's pleasing to man. Now our lesson today is taken from 1 Peter. And Peter is writing to a church which we know today is in the country of Turkey. This church was facing persecution and, and Peter was, in, was encouraging them to keep their faith and their focus on Christ. So what is a church that is living for Christ? What is it? It's a body of people that's being obedient to Him. In our lesson today in verse 1, we're for laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies, hypocrisies, crisis, excuse me, and envious and all evil speaking. You know, to be a part of the body of Christ and for us to live holy lives, first Peter, or first of all, Peter says that we need to lay aside things that with uh, other members of the family of God. We need to remove any behavior that we may have that may cause problems with other church members. You know, churches have split all across our country because someone has caused a problem within the church. Causing problems is not living for Christ. Now, Peter here, he lists five sins in this verse that can tear a church apart. First is malice. This is an attitude or action that can cause harm to others. And something that a church member should not do is ever, ever hold a grudge against someone. You know, holding a grudge will only cause harm in, with the unity of the church. Next, Peter says, all guile, which means fraud or deceit. Now, a church member should... We should never tell lies against another member. This would include gossip. You know, talking about someone in a negative sense, it's only going to cause harm. Hypercrisis now is something that a lot of church members actually are guilty of. You know, trying to make yourself look good, even though it might make someone else look bad. A lot of people, and this, this is bad to say, but a lot of people that go to church will put on a good act on Sunday while they're there at church. But as soon as they leave the parking lot, their lives revert back to the ways of the world. This can actually make the church look bad. 
as a Christian, we're to be separate from the world. We're different. We're different than the world. You know, people, some people, they may put on good impressions of themselves while they're at church, but Monday through Saturday, they live for the world. Then they, those people, are not fulfilling the real purpose that God has for their life. They're hypocrites, which can cause harm to the church. Peter then says envies, which is jealousy. Now, a lot of times these people, they just have self-interest. They look at things as what is best for them, no matter who else it might hurt. Now, if John, if he goes fishing at the beach, and man, the fish is biting, big fish. In fact, he brings back a truckload of fish back with him. And the stories he starts telling, big stories. Then I go the next week to the beach, and I catch nothing except maybe some junk fish. I come back to church the next Sunday, and I give him a cold shoulder because he caught fish, and I didn't. I'm jealous, especially when people start questioning my fishing abilities. I should actually be happy for him. Glad, I should be glad that he had such a good fishing trip. And then I hope he might give me a fish or two to fry. When something, the point is, when something is good going for someone, we should be happy for them not envy with their fortune. Then the last one Peter mentions is evil speaking. We should never, ever slander each other at church. Now these five sins that Peter mentions will cause problems in God's family. And don't think for a minute that Satan isn't hard at work trying to cause problems in God's family. Satan, he delights. He delights if any church member is doing any of these sins. If anybody does, then they are not living in obedience to Jesus. In verse 2, his newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. You know, for a newborn baby, for them to grow and be healthy, they need to have good nourishment. They need milk. Peter says for a Christian, especially a new Christian, they should have the desire to seek proper nourishment. And this proper nourishment is in the sincere milk of the word. God's Word, it's nourishment for every one of us. And when we study and read God's Word, come to church and hear God's Word taught and, and preached, what we're doing, we're getting nourishment. We will grow and mature in Jesus, which that is what is pleasing to God. In verse 3, if so ye, be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now Peter, he knew that the ones he was writing to, they were saved because they accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He said they have tasted God's goodness when they put their faith in Christ. Now if you think about it, we all have tasted God's goodness. Just the only, only thing we have to do, just think back. Think back when you were saved. Just think how you, how you felt when you were saved. You know, that load of sin, hey, it was removed. It was gone. 
just think how great, how great that felt. I remember when I was saved, I felt like I could walk on air. I tasted, I tasted that the Lord is gracious. What a great God we serve. In verse 4, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. To, to, to whom coming is the people that had repented and put their faith in Jesus. The living stone is referring to Jesus. This, is, this verse here is talking about the foundation of the church. Jesus, he is the cornerstone. And we also we can say Jesus is the cornerstone of the body of Christ. He is solid, unshakable, and he cannot be moved. Now Jesus, he was rejected by most people while he is here on earth. He is also, he was rejected by the Jewish religious leaders. So most people, they reject Jesus. But here, here is the important part in why we can say that the foundation of Christ is solid. Jesus was chosen of God. And God sees him as precious. Precious meaning Jesus is valued and honored by God. So what's more important, being honored by men or be honored by God? I think we all know the answer to that. I choose the solid foundation of Christ. In verse 5, ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You know, when we accept Jesus or when we accept Christ, our body becomes a living stone with Jesus being the cornerstone. Holy means we're set apart for a purpose. You know, back in the Old Testament, the priest would sac would offer sacrifices there in the temple. But now in the New Testament, we are the temple of God. And we are the priest of the temple. We offer uh, up sacrifices that are pleasing to God. This is not an option. This is a command. Now, we don't always do things that we're wanting to do. But a lot of times we do what God is wanting us to do. Spiritual sacrifices are offered through Jesus in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. These sacrifices are always acceptable to God. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. It may not be a good one, but I'll give you one. An example is instead of going to the movie theater to watch a movie, maybe you've been really wanting to see this movie. We stay at home and read God's Word, and have a talk with God. Because this is what the Holy Spirit was guiding us to do. And we obey the Holy Spirit. This is a sacrifice that is acceptable to God. In verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So here Peter calls Jesus the chief cornerstone. You know, when a home or a building is being built, especially back then or even today, but you know what they did? They started with the corner, in the corner placing a stone on the, on the foundation, and then all the other stones were positioned in relation to that cornerstone. You know, when they built my house, they laid a foundation 
and they started in the corner placing a cinder block. And all other cinder blocks were positioned with that corner block. So what Peter is saying is that for the church, Jesus is the foundation and is the cornerstone. We need to put our trust and keep our focus on Him. Because if the church, if we ever, ever lose focus on Jesus, then we get out of line with God. In verse 7, Unto you therefore which believed He is precious, but unto them which is dis disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Okay, for us that have put our faith in Jesus, Jesus is precious to us. You know, we know. We know what he has done for us and what he's doing for us. Jesus, he has fulfilled God's gift of salvation to all that believe. It's an honor. It is an honor to be a child of God. And we are never ashamed of calling him Lord. But for those who are disobedient, they don't believe, they've rejected Jesus. They don't see Jesus as meeting any of their needs that they desire. They see Jesus and, and religion as just useless in their life. They live for the world. Even though they know and they realize that their, that time is going to end for them. They don't think about eternity or their soul because they, they, just, they just can't see it. They don't think about it. So they ignore anything to do with Jesus. These people will receive judgment and condemnation for their sins. One day, they're going to bow down before the throne of God and confess that Jesus is Lord. But for them, it's sad. It's too late. In verse 8, in a stone of stumbling and in a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Peter says that for those who have refused to believe, they're going to stumble and they're going to fall. They've, ex they've refused to accept God's fullest revelation of himself as the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Refuse to believe it. They've, dim, they've been disobedient because of their unbelief, which, the, which is the only unforgivable sin. All those who reject Jesus and reject God's offer of salvation through Jesus, again, they're going to face God's judgment and will be separated from God in hell. This is their appointment that they cannot break on their own. So sad. Verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should that ye, ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Chosen generation in Greek is translated family. You know, back in the Old Testament, Israel was God's chosen people. But now, anyone that has, has accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, We've been adopted into God's family, both Jew and Gentile. You know, as a child of God, we have direct access to God. 
And therefore, we're considered a priest. As a priest, we're, to go be we're the go-between God and the lost. Our primary purpose is to proclaim the gospel to this lost world. We're set apart. We're set apart from the ways of the world because we belong to God. That is the reason this world calls us a peculiar people. We're different. It's our duty to share the good news of the gospel. Peter says that we're, we're, we are called to do, do so. I guess, I, I guess we can say we're, we're summoned to do so. And one reason we're to do so is because God has called us out of darkness of this world through Jesus. We're called to his marvelous light. We're being, we are being transferred from darkness of the world, which we were a slave to sin. We're transferred, praise God, to the kingdom of God, which we're sinless because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. In verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Not a people is referring back before we were saved. We were separated from God because of sin in our life. But after we were saved, we are the people of God. We've obtained mercy when we put our faith in Jesus. And at that very moment that we did that, this gives me chill bumps. <laughs> at that very moment that we were saved, we became a part of the family of God. In verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which, which war against the soul. Now, when we were saved, we became strangers of the world. We're just a bunch of pilgrims traveling through this world. This world, hey, it's not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. You know, Peter then says we need to stay away from certain things such as lust. You know, we're in a battle. We are in a battle every day. And Satan will do anything to try to get us to sin against God. We're in a constant fight. And that is why that we need to keep our focus on Jesus always, every day. In verse 12, having your conversations honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which shall, be, shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Having your conversation is referring to our lifestyle. Our lifestyle as a Christian should be good it should be honest. And the thing about it is, unbelievers, guess what? They're going to notice the, They're going to notice us. They may not like it. You know, they may say things against us. You know, the thing is, we're seeing this happen more and more today. How people are making fun of Christians. You know, a lot of times they're calling Christians all kinds of bad names. But Jesus says we should rejoice. When someone acts this way toward us, he said our reward is great in heaven. Peter says we should glorify God. Give him honor and praise, and we should worship Him. Think about it. We're saved. We've been adopted in God's family. 
our citizenship. It's in heaven. And the thing about it, it's nothing that we did. It's all about Jesus. What he did for us on the cross, he deserves, he deserves our praise and worship. So I'm going to close with this. So the point of our lesson, the short point here for us to remember, is for our church. Our church is built on Christ. Jesus is our foundation. And all we got to do is just keep our focus on Jesus. Thank you.